My name is Barbara Kellerman, and I'm currently Research Director of the Center for Public Leadership. And it is my uh, task for the moment to introduce my colleague, Todd Patinsky, and also to say a few words of welcome to Larry Kramer. I particularly uh, am pleased to do this because it's about as authentic an introduction as I've ever been called on to give, <laughs> as those who have heard me on the subject of Larry Kramer will attest. I teach a course at the school called Leadership Literacy, and toward the end of the semester, we deal with people who have written as acts of leadership, as well as, in some cases, been leaders themselves. This includes a very small number of people, such as Betty Friedan, Martin Luther King, Rachel Carson, and the gentleman to my left. Uh, I actually consider Larry Kramer singular in so many ways that it would be impossible to recount them here. But for those of us who are interested in leadership, for those of us who are interested in the role of the individual as an agent of change, I commend to you the life and times of Larry Kramer. He is the real deal. <laughs> My preferred label for him was, is the title of an article about him that was written for the New Yorker, I guess about a year or a little over a year ago, by Michael Spector. And the title of the article is Public Nuisance. Larry Kramer is a public nuisance, and I say that as the highest <laughs> possible accolade. It is my honor and privilege not to introduce Larry Kramer, because that will be done by Todd Patinsky, but to be uh, able to listen to you, Larry, it is with uh, great affection, even, <laughs> and respect that I look forward to hearing you. <coughs> so Todd, on to you and to Larry. Okay, so I have the um, next task of doing a more formal introduction. I'm going to go at a pretty fast clip because our goal today is to have as much time and conversation as we can. Um, really, I just want to say a couple of thank yous. Um, first, the Center for Public Leadership would like to thank two student groups at the Kennedy School. We'd like to thank Alana, which is the Alliance for African American, Latino, Asian American, Native American, and Allies. And then the second group would be the BGLT caucus at the Kennedy School. So thank you to them for helping us to organize today. Um, next, a thank you to some folks within the center, um, notably Connie Jensen and Brandy Adams for just a tremendous amount of legwork um, to coordinate three schedules, to coordinate the Charles, to coordinate the communications. So thank you to Connie and thank you to Randy. Um, finally, thank you to our guests. Um, thank you to Jonathan Katz, who we have the pleasure of joining, or we have the pleasure of having here today. Jonathan is executive coordinator of the Larry Kramer Initiative for Lesbian and Gay Studies at Yale. Uh, prior to that, he was the first tenured professor in gay and lesbian studies in the United States. Um, he's been on faculty at SUNY Stony Brook, as well as the uh, City University of San Francisco. Um, other distinguished contributions include co-founding um, the activist group Queer Nation, and in addition, serving as a fellow in the Sexuality Research Program of the Social Science Research Council. So very glad to have Jonathan with us here today. <laughs> so how it's going to work today is Jonathan's really going to facilitate a conversation with Larry. Um, we're hoping to have at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes for Q&A, so um, definitely please. Um, it, we intended it to be a dialogue, so please um, don't be shy. Um, let me just uh, close by doing a formal introduction of Larry. Um, Larry is an internationally renowned playwright, screenwriter, novelist, and journalist. He's a central, um, I would say the central, uh, figure in the history of AIDS advocacy within the U.S. and internationally. In 1991, he co-founded the Gay Men's Health Crisis. 81. 1981. In 1987, he founded ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, which is the international AIDS advocacy and protest organization. Um, on a personal note, I think of Larry Kramer as someone who got a little impatient or grew quite impatient with the pace that history progresses at, um, acted up, and in doing so changed history. So it really is personally inspiring to have him here with us today. 
So for these reasons, very pleased to have him and ask you to join me in welcoming him to Harvard. Thank you. Thank you. Larry, I thought it would be um, a good idea to begin by asking you to, um, to select out of your many accomplishments two or three that you think of as defining or central to your legacy. Oh, these are all such loaded words. Um, I don't think in those kind of terms. Legacy, I don't know what legacy what do you, is. What are you most proud of? I guess, the, I guess LKI, the Larry Kramer Initiative. Uh, mm. It took me, I don't know, 30 years to get Yale to 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 uh, uh, to accept gay studies as a as something worthy of being taught. Um, I'm very proud of of some of the things that ACT UP accomplished. Of course, um, I'm proud of a lot of things, but I don't, it's hard to look at anything. At least I had an agent once in London, an incredible woman called Margaret Ramsey, Peggy Ramsey. I don't know if you ever saw a movie about Joe Wharton called Prick Up Your Ears. Vanessa Redgrave played Peggy Ramsey, and she was just like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> really over the top. And uh, she represented every great writer in, in England. And I lived in England for 10 years, and, and I was just starting out as a writer, and she took me on. And she s said something to me that, that I've, me I've always lived by and I've never forgotten it is, don't believe your good reviews because uh, it'll go to your head and there's much more work to do. And I guess that's pretty much how I feel. It's nice hearing all those things. I always think you're talking about somebody else. And um, I'm always amazed when anybody shows up or that anybody knows who I am. And because there is so much more work to do. Um, and, and that's Good. hard to talk about achievements um, because there are only partial, not even victories, partial movements. Can I ask you, the, the combination of writer and activist is a, is a rare one. Um, well, it's more European than American mm. and more South American than America. Mm. That's true. And that's, that's, that's another terrible thing about the arts in this country, I guess. I don't mm. know. I never could understand why. I made a list somewhere of all, all the great American writers, and, and, and they would never said a word about AIDS, and it includes just about every great person you can think of. Mailer, Styron, Updike, Miller, um, on and on. Toni Morrison, and, uh, and, you, and yet, if, if, if practically every great European writer or South American writer has written about this. So. Did you find writing um, constraining? D do you have a, a personality that likes a kind of social engagement? No, just the reverse. I'm essentially a shy person, and I, I uh, get nervous when I'm away from my computer. <laughs> 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 Whatever. <coughs> it's, it's, a, it's a great release to be able to, to. It was a great discovery for me when I, I realized that I could, I could use my anger uh, creatively. Um, I happen to think, or I've come to think, that anger is a wonderful emotion. Um, but like every other emotion, you have to learn how to live with it and deal with it. And when I realized that I could, that I had a gift of stringing words together that would, that, that could, could somehow get to some people, that was, that was, that was a good feeling, and, and it still is. Mm. Um, we, we tend to know you generally most broadly for your role in AIDS activism. Did you emerge sort of Athena-like uh, at the dawning of the plague as an activist or was there a previous activist history that no. has not been? No. I was, um, I guess I've written about this in somewhere or other in reports from the Holocaust. I mean, I was just a New York faggot like everybody else mm -hmm. who was gay then. I didn't march in the parade. Uh, we used to be at Fire Island and we would make fun of all that. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And in fact, for the first probably few years of, of, of being an activist, I resented being called an activist. Uh, you know, it's just a label. Uh, 
and I, I didn't look upon it as complimentary originally. Um, what came to be AIDS hit my friends first of all, um, in, in first of all. Um, <coughs> all the houses at Fire Island that were near ours, people were getting sick, and so I was thrown into it, and, um, and that's basically how it all happened. Uh, I had gone to Yale, and at Yale, there's sort of an extracurricular course in uh, believing that because you went to Yale, the world was yours. <laughs> that, that, that just having, my father used to say to me, who had also gone to Yale, he said, I don't care what your grades are. Just get that piece of paper with Yale on it. No one will ever ask you <laughs> what your grades are. And he was right. Um, and, I, and I had spent, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years, probably more, in the film industry where I, where I had been very successful. And not only before I made Women in Love, I was the assistant to the president of first um, the United Artists and then, uh, or was it the other way around, Columbia. And um, I was used to power. I was used to helping run enormous companies with, with hundreds, thousands of employees worldwide, with huge budgets, with a great amount of latitude to make uh, decisions. And, um, and I was used to people listening to me when I asked for something. Um, nicely, of course. And the very first time I had a call or attempt to call the mayor of New York, Ed Koch, and had to deal with the people around him and was made to feel like a piece of shit, I got very angry. And that, that's what started it. It was the anger at being treated like a piece of shit. And you begin to realize how people all over the world are treated just like that. And um, it went from there. When you gave that famous sort of defining speech uh, at the dawn of, of AIDS activism, did you anticipate its consequences? What were the series of, of decisions that led up to that speech? Did you think of it that you were going to spark a movement, or, or was that an unintended consequence of it? Which speech are you talking oh, about? 1200 counting. Oh. There was a speech, it was an article I wrote for yeah. The Native, and um, there was a, a New York Native, was a, a gay newspaper that existed for a while. Um, no, uh, but the question is, did I know anything was gonna happen? And the answer to that is probably yes. Um, it just, and I can't understand why people keep saying that I was so <coughs> prophetic, or whatever the word is. It just seems so logical. How could you not, anybody who had spent a night in the meat rack, in the meat rack at Fire Island Pines uh, throughout the night, put two and two together? I mean, it just was, it was, it was there for everybody to see. Um, and, and, and anyway, um, I forgot the question. Well, so, so <laughs> you, when, when you wrote that article in those early days, did you, did you conceive of yourself as attempting to forge an activist organization, or was that an unintended act, uh, result? You have, to, you have to understand, and this is something, if you were to have one lesson about leadership or whatever in this, in this school, it's, I don't, I don't really think all this shit can be taught. We made it up every day as we went along. Every day, something different was thrown in our lap. There were no lessons, there were no guidelines, there were no role models, and we had to somehow work. We had to, have, we had to work fast, and, uh, and uh, we didn't have time for niceties. We had to react on a dime, turn on a dime. And, and, and literally, we made it up as we went along. The, the, first, the, the first meeting of, 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 of of what became GMHC, um, I don't know how many there were, 15 people, whatever. Six of us started it. There were intermittent meetings that went on for nine months or so before we formalized ourselves. Basically what happened is the sicker people got and, and the more 
the more sick people people knew, the more people showed up at meetings. And what motivated the movement was fear. And I think fear is probably the best motivator going of anything. And I don't think, if you don't, if you don't think your life is at stake in some way, then you're not going to be a very good activist or one that lasts for very long. Because if you're going to be an activist, you have to do it every day for the rest of your life. Or else it's like, I don't know, the, the shore washes up over the sand and buries everything. And I guess you all have seen that. Something has to make you angry, and you have to somehow sustain that anger. And, um, and that's, I think, what is the best motivator at all. I, I, don't, I know you teach a lot of things like, let's all be nice to each other, and, and coalition building, and all that sort of stuff, which is ideally wonderful. But I gotta tell you, from three organizations, it's very hard to build coalitions. And it's so hard to build coalitions that you might just as well use that energy to deal with your own house. And if, if people want to come and join you, that's fine. But um, it's just real hard. People in groups don't behave well. Um, hmm. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you can talk about God and love and peace and all that until you're blue in the face. People in groups do not behave well. And and yet the emergency doesn't, doesn't diminish. So you only have, what I learned fairly quickly was, I only had so much energy, and um, even more so now, but I was much younger then. And you have to zero in on the most, the most practical, pragmatic ways to use that energy. There were 8,000 issues that confronted GMHC and ACT UP every single day. And there were soon thousands of kids who each had a different interest. And you had to somehow keep it all focused. What is our goal? Our goal is not to do X and Y and Z and make everybody love each other and build all these coalitions. Our, our, our goal is to get this, this, this plague attended to and to find medicines to cure it. And we were very exceedingly successful. And that's ACT UP's greatest achievement in getting the medicines and the, cure, and the almost cures. Um, whether we got the world to pay attention to that, I don't know. I was with, last night I was with, um, they had dinner with Bob Bazell, who is the, the science reporter for Tom Brokaw's NBC News. And he said, AIDS is a non-story now, again, in this country. I mean, periodically this goes on all the time and you can't get anybody to write a story about it or do anything about it. They'll write about Africa um, but they won't write about anything in America. So, that's what I say, you have to be, an act, you cannot stop being an activist. There's not much left of ACT UP anymore. Uh, there, there are some valiant members. GMHC, of course, has become um, sort of like the Red Cross, um, <laughs> which it did very quickly, I might add, which is why I had so many fights with them. Uh, it became much too pastoral and, and not at all, um, whatever you want to call it, confrontational, which is why I found it ACT UP. But we were confronted with the realities of life. Almost everybody in ACT UP died. Um, and they just, the, the, the younger generations are not interested in any of this, which often, which often happens. So I don't think there's much, uh, activism left in, 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 on a group basis in this country. There's a lot of pastoral stuff, um, which is well and good and fine and good for your soul. But um, nobody is, 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 is confronting the system, which is how we got the stuff in the first place. And if I were to suggest anything to be taught here, it would be on how to, how to confront the system not to work the system or work with the system, how to beat it over the head with a with a with a, with a, with a bat, um, and 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 take no prisoners. Uh, just a few more questions, and then I think we can open it up. Larry, do do you have any explanation, either thought through or immediate, <coughs> for the current quiescence and and activism? 
as I said, I don't think people are afraid. Mm. Um, there's a very interesting, this very interesting article, argument about gay marriage. So many gays are against it, including my own partner. And um, they don't want to copy the straits, or they don't want to blah, blah. It's, it, it's, it's a matter of dollars and cents and, and being pragmatic. There are over 1,000 financial things that the United States government gives to you when you are married, if you are straight, starting with you name it. Ta being able to have less taxes, being able to leave your estate to a spouse without paying those taxes, uh, being able to adopt children, being able to, um, all things that are exceedingly valuable. And so it's not, so who the fuck cares if it's duplicating a, 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 a ceremony or whatever that, 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 that you, that the straight world has maybe not extolled in the best way. And, and I, get, I get very impatient with arguments uh, such as this. Yes, it would be nice if it, were, it, it would be easier if we called it something else that, that, that the church and all of them would go along with uh, like, and give us the same rights, but let's, instead of calling it a marriage, call it a, a partnership or what. Yeah. Yeah. But until somebody comes along and, and gets enough people to accept that, we're stuck with this definition. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> well, well, I think <laughs> about, about the current sort of quiescence, yeah. Oh, I, think you I try not to think about it. It's very depressing. The gay, the gay I don't want to call it a community because community is, is too small a word for, for what we are. It's very discouraging. I think people are very discouraging. Um, and I think you find it in every, in every movement mm. all the time. But it's, it's sort of heartbreaking to, to see um, infections on the rise again in the, in the gay world when people know better by now. And it just, it's like a slap in the face to everybody who died. It's a slap in the face to all the work we did. Just so, you know, we didn't, we didn't fight like hell to get you the medicines for you to go out and, and, have, and have, have unsafe sex just because the medicines are there. Very dispiriting. Mm. I, I try basically not to, to think about it. I, mm. I, I occasionally write about it and I talk about it here. Mm. Um, it's, it's hard to accept that so many people whom you love have so little sense of responsibility to themselves and to the world. And that's, and that's in, in essence, for everybody mm. as well. How much of the famous or infamous uh, Larry Kramer combativeness is performative? How much of it is strategic and calculated? And how much comes sort of straight through? Uh, it was never strategic and calculated. I'm, I'm a very uh, instinctive person. and. And, and prick me and I, and I scream. Mm. Um, I, I was amazed the first time I was called the angriest, whatever, the angriest gay man in the world or whatever. And um, I don't think, people, when, I, when they interview me, they say, oh, you're such a pussycat. And I guess that's how I look at myself. <laughs> but um, I realized that the description was useful. And so I allowed it. And, um, and didn't counteract it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was never, ever instinctive. I never rehearsed a speech in front of a mirror or, 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 or thought of, of ways to make people get off their feet. Mm -hmm. Everything I've written is always out of my own passion. And, um, and I, hope, I hope it shows that. I hope it doesn't appear. Uh, calculated. I wouldn't know how to how to calculate it. And um, can you say something about your current activist investments in addition to <laughs> HIV? Oh, activist investments, my life. Yeah. <laughs> what what issues? Uh, well, um, when I had an, I had a liver transplant in, in December two thousand and one. 
and my surgeon, Dr. John Fung, I don't know why I'm getting <laughs> broken up about this, uh, who saved my life, um, asked me, before he accepted me for the transplant, um, why did I want to live, in essence? And because uh, I was very close to death. And I gave him two reasons. One was that I wanted more time with my lover, uh, David Webster. And the other was that I, I've been working, as many of you may know, on, a, on an exceedingly long and, and, and way overly ambitious uh, book called The American People, A History, which I actually started before uh, the, when I finished Faggots in 1978. And it's now some 3,000 pages long. And um, you will be happy to hear that my, e my editor likes it the way it is and does not want it cut. <laughs> <laughs> and I was terrified or s that I would die before I, I would f finish it. And that's what th was the second reason I gave. So um, my main... <laughs> My main impetus or whatever now is finishing the book. And I hate leaving a, a computer. And so I don't have as much time for the kind of street activism that I grew up on. Um, I have to finish this book. And it's, I can see the end in sight now. But it's still certainly a couple more years. And while my health is, is fine, um, it's, you know, you never know, as we all know. Um, I, I'm, I, and when I do something, when, when John hears that I've come to Harvard <laughs> or Michigan where I'm going next week or something, and while well, he's happy for me to do so, he, he will invariably say, you promised me a book. And indeed, I did, and myself. So I would like very much to be much more involved in the, in the issue of, of transplantation and organ donation, which does interest me and which is as big, a, as big a mess as anything else in this country is, which means a great deal. Um, it's an issue that, like AIDS, no one wants to write about or talk about very much or think about. Um, we were forced to think about AIDS, and that's usually when issues get attended to is when you're forced to think about something. If anyone were to say to you, you could die tomorrow because suddenly you got liver disease or cancer of a kidney or something, but by the time you got it, it was too late for you to become an activist on behalf of that, that's basically a problem. It's an issue that for some reason holds no interest, it would appear, to the media, to the public, to, to leaders. Um, it's a hot potato issue for a, for a politician for some unknown reason, uh, probably religious ones. Um, and it's very hard. Every, anyone will let me write an op-ed piece about AIDS, but they won't let me write an op-ed piece about, about the mess in, in, in transplantation. Mind you, the numbers, of course, are not nearly so horrific as, uh, as they are for, for HIV. Nevertheless, it's, it's, um, it's an easy thing to do, to leave your organs after you die. Um, you won't know, <laughs> so why does, it, why does it seem ghoulish to people? I don't know. Um, there, are, there are much more successful rates of what's called harvesting organs in Europe, particularly in Spain, which is a Catholic country, um, where in many countries in Europe, Spain, Germany, Austria, uh, a whole lot of them, everybody in that country is, is deemed a donor unless they opt out, which is just the reverse of what it is here, where you have to give your consent before they will take anything. Most places it's by signing the back of your driver's license. However, in more and more states and hospitals, that's not enough, signing the back of your driver's license. 
they want somebody else in the family to say, okay, which is, vitiates the effectiveness of the whole thing. Um, more and more people are going to need organs by the minute, especially as hepatitis C becomes such an enormous plague, another issue that doesn't get reported on very much. Um, so I would like to spend more time on that, and I try and talk about it whenever I can. I don't have a population of kids to go and storm uh, a government agency or anyone, um, nor do I think I could rouse up a crowd, even though I have a lot of people who, who what can I do, Larry, that kind of thing. Um, it's not anything that the AIDS activists, particularly what the few that are left, want to deal with, nor do they have energy for it, because right now the biggest issue is, is getting um, drugs cheap, if not for free, uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the needy around the world. Uh, we've actually made a certain amount of progress on, in, in that, and actually the lead for that did come out of several people from ACT UP. Um, so there is a continuing <laughs> legacy. Should we open it up? Questions? Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, uh, I was a bit surprised when I heard um, in the State of the Union address, uh, Bush talked about uh, advocating spending money, uh, allocating money for, for global AIDS treatment and prevention. And uh, I'd like to think I wasn't completely taking it. Uh, I try to understand the politics of that and how it's been playing out since. I wonder if you can talk about how you see it, uh, where you think it should go, uh, or what people might do now to, 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 to refocus, redirect. Vote, vote for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, you, you, you were surprised that the, the that it, that it happened, you mean all that money? Well, so did everybody else. But I had a piece in the New York Times not so long ago where I predicted that very little of that money would ever see the light of day. And so, so is certainly the case up till now. Um, there's a wonderful op-ed column today by that new guy, David, somebody or other, Brooks, in which he he just says, you know, Bush is the biggest liar since, since whoever, Pinocchio. <laughs> uh, and that more and more of that, I gathered the time had a cover last week or something where it said, not by a long shot, whatever. And it's amazing that so much of that is beginning to surface, which is great, that he is a liar. And that he just, there's a very good article in The Nation this week when you try, when you fly a U.S. air shuttle, you may sell the free magazines they give you <laughs> that you don't ordinarily see. Um, most, uh, the, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's head of uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, is responsible for most of that happen. He's managed to become a friend of George Bush's and has influence in the White House and managed to somehow convince the powers that be that this would be a good idea. And indeed, at the time, he was able to convince them they needed something to make him look good. But it really is um, taking so long that by the time the stuff gets to anybody, I'm, I, just, I just am depressed enough on that issue to believe that everybody's going to die. I truly do. Um, there's no way you can save whatever it is, 60 million people. Um, I also had, in the same op-ed piece in the, in the Times, said that, that I thought it was evil that drug companies charged at all for the medicines. And um, I think that that threw a certain fear into them, that this might take off as a, as a movement. And so they've become much more amenable to negotiating. But it's ridiculous, you know. Two dollars a day is still more than, than can be afforded. Um, and so many of these drugs were paid for by us. People don't know that. 
And that's bothered me since the very beginning because the very first drug that was approved was AZT, which we paid for, lock, stock, and barrel. And the government, the National Cancer Institute, to get the, to get the drug fast into the, into the world, gave the patent to the company that was then called um, Burroughs Welcome, which is now called GlaxoSmithKline. And they proceeded, as they still do, to charge fifteen, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year for a drug that was basically given to them for free, and that, w and that we should be the ones making the money for. And that just exists across the board. I would say that uh, that that every drug that is out there now has had some 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 government financing through through the NIH. And nobody nobody. I've said it, it's been said, everybody knows it, nobody does anything about it, you know. Glaxo has been sued um, over this issue of ownership and because they were smart enough at the very beginning to make sure that all the papers were put in their names, there is no legal, uh, no legal thing to sue them on. I hate them. I come from um, Kenya, it's nice to see you because I've followed your story for a long time. And I'm a journalist and I write a lot about AIDS and uh, my reason for being at the KSG is to go into AIDS advocacy after this. And my problem is in Kenya we are losing 700 people every day to AIDS. We have 30 million people in Africa. Only 70, 76,000 have access to drugs. And those are the few that have been given by the six large companies that we know about. My bitterness is that Whereas a few months ago, the president here offered to give us 15 billion and to start off with 3 billion a year, that has remarkably reduced 1.8 billion. We're talking about now. We have debt now. We have someone dying in Kenya every minute of AIDS. What's your comment about this? Because it, it, it may be a small issue here, but in Africa, when you're talking about that kind of a population, we are talking about, in a few years' time, Africa will not, will not be there because there will be nobody. Almost everybody is suffering. Every other person you meet in Kenya, every, every six people you meet in Kenya, one is HIV positive. So what are we talking about? We are talking about now, and, we are, and, this, and the country and the president here or whoever is offering us the money is talking later. It's not even coming this year. That money is coming next year. It's even been pushed. The little has been pushed. What's your comment about this? Because the issue is now. Um, you're not going to like my answer. Um, what's the population of Kenya? Well, three years ago we were. What is it? What it? So you have to. Uh, while I certainly think the pressures of all sorts have to be brought upon our country and on our, our, and our government, there's remarkably little um, activism of a confrontational nature in any of these countries. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of activists there. I know many of them myself. And it's like the early days here where you just cannot get the people off their asses to fight for their lives. You're there, and somehow these people, your people, have to be made to, to s shove it in their faces. Or do all the things that, that we did to get our drugs. Uh, tie up governments, tie up industry, tie up traffic, tie up uh, everything you can think of. S sit ins in, 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 in president's offices. Uh, poor fake blood in department stores. Uh, I mean, they're legendary things that we do, that we did. Uh, how this man, Mbeki, gets away with this shit, why somebody hasn't assassinated him, is beyond me. What is wrong with the population of that country that, he let, that they let him get away with this? I and mean, he still to this day is saying, uh, whatever, it's not a disease, the, the drugs don't work, blah, blah, blah. The man is certifiably insane. And yet, 
he gets away with it. And after a while, you have to realize nobody is going to save you but yourselves. And I don't know how you get that message out to the people. You're going to die anyway. So you might as well die valiantly. Uh, somehow. Um, I can see the faces of, of my kids in, in 1988, 87, 88, 89, when things were really desperate. And, and uh, people rushing up to me at meetings and, and, and saying, who were sick, saying, have you heard of anything, anything, anything in the pipeline, anything that's coming along that I can tell you, I'll take anything. They're all dead now, but they were out there fighting to get those anythings. There isn't one government building in Washington that we didn't penetrate somehow. We knew, we knew the system inside out. We knew the bureaucracy inside out. We knew the pharmacokinetics of the medicines inside out. If need be, and indeed several times we did, we actually had several of the early drugs manufactured ourselves in Canada uh, and, and passed around. Um, we stole the formulas from, from the pharmaceutical companies. Um, those drugs that are out there now didn't just materialize because a lot of people um, you know, walked around the streets with banners. We scared the shit out of them. And we knew our, we knew what we were talking about. That's another thing that we learned how to do, is we educated ourselves. We knew more about the science, the medicine of AIDS, than the doctors did, than the pharmaceutical companies did. I took two of my guys once to a meeting with Bristol Myers, uh, with the scientists at Bristol Myers who were not giving us whatever drug they had then, DDI. Um, and at a break, I was in the John, and one of the doctors said to me, referring to, to one of the boys, that, 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 that Harrington person, that he's a Dr. Harrington, isn't he? He wasn't a doctor, but he had taught himself everything. Early on in ACT UP's history, an amazing woman came into our presence just uh, uh, a dowdy Dr. Iris Love. She was a PhD microbiologist. And she said, you guys don't know anything. And we did it. And she said, I will teach you what I know. And she formed these little groups and she taught them everything that was known about HIV at the time. How do you apply for government grants? How do you deal with the system of grants? How, how do you deal with the NIH and the FDA? We didn't know what they were. The NIH, the FDA, were a bunch of letters. They're enormous bureaucracies. How do you penetrate these systems? You have to know all that so that you can, in essence, be the enemy and, and, and get behind the enemy lines. And that's the mentality you have to use. You have to know more than they do. They have to be frightened of you. I would sit down at at drug company negotiations and I would look at the man next to me and he would be shaking and I would turn to the other guy on the other side of me who would say, I'd say, what's wrong with Dr. So-and-so? And he would say, he's scared of you. <laughs> Great. They've got to be frightened of you. Becky has got to be frightened of those people, of his people. He shouldn't be allowed to leave his whatever in, in, in his limousine without people throwing eggs at him. That's how you get things in the system. You do not get more with honey than with, the, with vinegar. Don't talk to me about that. You get, you get it by being harsh, demanding, and in their face, constantly. So yes, I have great sympathy for, obviously, for, 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 for Africa and the people there. But it is tempered by this, by this knowledge, you know. I've heard people come and make the same play, plea that you do. Everybody comes to America asking for us to take care of you. And in many instances, we want to take care of you. But there are a lot of, everybody wants to be taken care of, and there are a lot of populations in this country who don't want to take care of you. But you can't look to others to take care of you when you won't take care of yourself. So that's what I mean, you won't like my answer. <laughs> OK, thanks. Hi. Hello. My question's a little abstract, maybe you can tell me. 
No, 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 and no. <laughs> um, you just got to get used to the fact they don't like you out there. They are never going to like like gay people. They're just not. Uh, and get used to it. So don't turn into a victim because of it. Turn into somebody who's proud and just stand up and say, fuck you, um, in the nicest possible way if you want to. <laughs> Um, how, ma how many people from the Harvard Kennedy School are in the government now running the government? So that says something about how effective whatever it is you're teaching here is. This country is in as big a mess as I've ever seen it, this government. So I don't know, that's what I said to Barbara, I don't know if you can, t you can teach this stuff. I mean, I think you can, you can, you can brainstorm it or whatever, but you're also thinking, which we all uh, tend to do in our dreams, to um, globally, whatever. You, th you think there's, there's one magic fix for everything, one magic pattern for the system that'll, that'll work. It won't. Every, you, gotta, you gotta take every pimple, and you gotta be responsible for your pimple. And, and, and you have to know everything there is to know about that pimple and deal with getting that pimple excised. That's what I said when we were in ACT UP and people wanted to you know, deal with you know, Guatemala or, or whatever, you know, eight, eight zillion you know, discrimination, all these kind of things which are very valid. Cure is what we were there for. Find something to keep people alive. We haven't got energy to deal with the fact that, yes, there is discrimination, and yet, yes, Guatemala's in trouble or whatever. You gotta focus on your issue. What is your issue that interests you? Because you're the one that's gonna be running that show. It's like when you write a novel, you don't, <laughs> I should apply it to myself, but it's not true. <laughs> when you write a novel, you focus on, you zero in on what you're trying to say. What gets your juices going? You know, people say, what can I do? <laughs> and I say, what do you want to do? You know, what makes you angry? What, what would sustain your energy? And learn all you can about it. Who are, your, who are the heavies? Who are the cast of characters? And they're usually far fewer than you think. You know, you're never going to get to George Bush. Um, I mean, you can get to George Bush symbolically. You can chain yourself to the White House fence or whatever. But, you know, there are always eight zillion assholes down the line who control everything. And that's what you find out. The people we had to wound up dealing with, we'd never heard of before. And they change constantly, such being the nature of, of bureaucracy. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of work. And that scares everybody more than anything. No, I don't think there's anything that can fix the world. Um, there are a lot of things we can do to, to alleviate certain things. And that's the best. When is that? When is that decision being handed down? Any day. Oh, please! It's like three months now. Yeah, it was uh, mid-July was the court's internal deadline, which they skipped over. And were really Have they actually decided it and not released it? Uh, there, there are dozens of rumors. <laughs> really knows. Yeah. Um, so we're uh, waiting each day. Mm -hmm. and pushing versus sort of an, an inside 
Well, I said it have to be either or. It doesn't. One reason ACT UP works so well is that we played good cop, bad cop. And most successful corporations work that way. You have somebody being nice to them, and you have somebody kicking them in the ass. And, um, and I've been a part of enough regular corporations um, to have seen it very effectively. Uh, both, the, both the film companies that I worked for practice this very successfully. You have somebody who's got to hold the hands of all the creative people and make sure that they're, they're happy. And you've got somebody, on the other hand, who's making sure they don't get enough money and, you know, and, and the, the, that they don't feel completely loved because it'll go to their heads. Um, ACT UP had a lot of people like myself or like, like um, um, well, the names will mean nothing to you, but who could go in and deal with people on their level with the knowledge that we acquired. And we had the street troops who can, while we were talking to them, be outside at the same time, perhaps making a lot of noise, showing that we had, we had troops. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see much uh, energy behind the, the uh, I see a few people like Evan Wilson and, and, um, and out there breaking their, their butts on the marriage issue, but I don't get, I don't feel the energy from the rest of us. Uh, but then I don't feel it, I don't feel any rest of us for almost any issue you can name. It's a bad time. I'm amazed that George Bush has gotten away for so long with, with such hideous behavior. It's, it's just truly amazing. I mean, why aren't... I, when we had, a, I remember in the early days of ACT UP, we had a, we had a demonstration outside of New York City Hall. And, um, you know, we had a couple hundred people, which was pretty good for us. And there was a journalist there from Brazil, a woman. And she came over to me <laughs> and she said, you call this a demonstration? She said, when, in my country, when they raise the bus fare, they burn the buses. <laughs> I mean, you laugh, but in a nutshell, that's what you have to do. It wasn't easy for a lot of people to, we never burned buses, and we never destroyed property, and we never did a lot of the things that a lot of us would have been happy if we had done. Um, I tried to, uh, <laughs> in one of my more desperate acts, to, uh, to uh, <laughs> gather a group of people to <laughs> learn how to fire weapons and uh, learn how to handle guns uh, and got no, <laughs> got no takers. Um, you know, just to scare people or whatever. But, <laughs> but you have to think in those terms. You cannot be, uh, I think right now in Massachusetts, there's not much you can do until the decision comes down. It wouldn't help to protest, I don't think, at this point. I may be wrong, but, um, but sit it out and see what happens. If it's against us, then you make a lot of noise if you're able to raise, raise the forces to do so. But right now, I don't, it'll just sort of scare them, I think, if, if it's on the fence in any way. I think, maybe if they saw, you know, 200,000 people clamoring for the right to marry uh, who were voters, it might scare them. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right, invite me up here to teach a course. <laughs> Know from one day to the next. 
But you don't teach, do you teach anger? Uh, well, it uh, depends on who you're talking to. Anybody who's ever been exposed to me. You made a point that I think it's peculiar to say it in a school of government. But in fact, many people, because we're so damn blessed in this country, yeah. and so damn blessed to be at Harvard, that your throwaway line about how people in groups generally don't behave very well, that's not a line that people around here necessarily, obviously many do, but necessarily viscerally understand. Now a lot of this is nasty. It's not all the world. Well, but you've had a lot of nasty stuff happen here in the last few years with your president and, and his relationship. You can talk about anything, you can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what that's. Uh, stop pushing, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember who was our guest here today? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm just uh, interested in the, in the juxtaposition. On the one hand, you're saying, uh, gee, you can't really teach this. Well, anger, fine. If you want to say that fear and anger are the prerequisites, but once you're, you know, a lot of people are afraid, and a lot of people are angry. Uh, we learn. And yet there is stuff that, you know, We learned by doing it, and I. Um, <coughs> If you if you actually had a course wherein people chose it, their issue and actually went out there and did something about it, um, that would be that would be impressive. But when I read all these things, a lot of it is theory, and Jonathan knows that I have an awful lot of trouble with you know, all these courses teaching gender and blah blah. Um, <laughs> And I didn't want to say this to Todd, but you know, when he starts telling me about his studies, about, you know, do older people want more sex than less or whatever, I just say, give me a break. Um, I hate all that. I hate epidemiology. I hate epidemiology. Um, what do you got when you, what do you got when you know it? You know, all right, old people have more sex than you think they have. Great. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with that? Um, Somebody's going to go out and give them condoms more or whatever. <laughs> um, so, much of, so much of what we study is, um, I think, a waste of time. Um, you only have so much time. And you have to learn how to use it effectively. And effectively, to me, is identifying what are the hideousnesses in your own personal life? And how do you make them less hideous? Eight, eight out of every nine sociological study that you read about is not dealing with the hideousness. Not on any level that I think is effective. So um, you might all question, and I hope you will, about what your goals are and, and, and how you can really effectively make the world a better place. You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a professor in the college. I'm not affiliated with the Kennedy School. <laughs> <laughs> does, that mean, does that mean that nobody wants the Kennedy School? <laughs> no, no. Uh,
comments perhaps from both of you on this. We don't have a Larry Summers at Harvard yet. Uh, in fact, Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer. Sadly, <laughs> you do have a Larry Summers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. You've got you. No, we don't. I, 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 you got t have you got tenure? Yes, I have tenure. All right. That sort of makes it easier to do these things. Uh, but even with uh, potential donors, we have to struggle with the design of, on the part of the university for unrestricted donations. That is to say, donations that would come from queer people that would go for superconductors, for example, mm -hmm. or greater, more buildings in Alston and Brighton. There are any number of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, challenges here. And, and since you started by saying, when Jonathan asked you that somewhat embarrassing question about the legacy, you immediately referred to the Larry Kramer Initiative at Yale. And I was hoping you could share some thoughts for, for us here at Harvard. Well, again, um I didn't, I didn't go about it in any way different than AIDS. It was, they made me angry, you know. And, um, and I did what I do best. I let everybody know. The media, you name it. And it wasn't very long before Yale looked very silly. Uh, and that finally got home. And uh, Calvin Trillin, you know who you may know who he is, is a good friend of mine, and and he is, was on the corporation, and he finally called the president and he said, and the provost, he said, "Do you have any idea how silly you look?" Uh, and Larry really is a pussycat, because they were scared shitless of me, um, and and that basically is what what got th that ball rolling. But like I said, it took it took. 25 years, whatever. And it sounds to me like you're being too polite. Um, and again, I just don't think you'll get anything. There must be other gay faculty people here. Um, you might threaten them. That's serious, you know. Name names, whatever. I don't, th I happen to think that's okay. Um, I'm, I don't think it's so awful to be called gay. Things like that. You have to somehow get troops in order, whatever. Um, I don't think Jonathan threatens anybody, but um, it's a tactic you might <laughs> consider. Well, and, and, and of course, Larry is bad cop, so I can be good cop, and it does make a difference. I mean, Larry is um, at least imaginatively always in the wings whenever the administration <laughs> talks to me, and it does make a difference. Well, it does now. They weren't, they yeah. weren't before. Yeah. almost, I would say, almost exclusively from committed to feminist causes. Mm -hmm. And well, that sounds, I don't know, it sounds to me like a long, like a long letter to the Crimson or something. Do you do that? Oh, we've done that. We're, we're, we're working on it. But who do you know, who do you know on the globe or, uh, or on a national, on a national news level? Uh, call the, I kid you not, call the Journal of Higher Education. Find out who's there. there that, that's really.